All right, so we're going to finish up with um, electrolyte balance. So electrolyte balance, electrolytes, which you probably have all seen these before, maybe related to Gatorade or something along those lines. But electrolytes are just simply salts. So sodium chloride, table salt, is an example of an electrolyte. <coughs> now, in the table salt form, it's a solid of sodium ionically bonded to chloride. But then when you put it into solution, an aqueous solution, such as a glass of water, or the solution that we have in our cells and surrounding our cells, that ionic bond breaks, and we end up with individual ions um, of sodium, the positive charge, and chlorine, or chloride with a negative charge. So salts can act as electrolytes, but then we can also have ions that are on their own that are electrolytes. Like you've heard before, bananas contain potassium, the potassium in a banana is actually going to be in an ion <coughs> form already, or an ion form. And you consume it, and you consume that potassium with a positive charge. So salts, and then also individual ions that we would find in food that we consume. Now, after consumption, the ions and the electrolytes that we're talking about, they end up in two places, either in the extracellular fluid or in the intracellular fluid. And they are going to help to determine the osmolarity of these solutions. Now, the normal osmolarity of human body fluid is roughly about 300 milliosmoles per liter. Now, those 300 milliosmoles, the reason we use osmolarity is because it gives us a reference to the electrolytes collection. So we're not just looking at a mole of sodium or a mole of chloride. We're looking at the osmolarity of the electrolytes collectively. Now, the extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid, their osmolarity may be 300 milliosmoles, but the molarity of each individual molecule is going to be different between the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. So, Osmolarity is 300 milliosmoles per liter, but the electrolyte composition of the fluids is going to be different. So I got a table for you, and you're going to want to be familiar with this table and maybe commit it to memory, because you're going to need to know some of these numbers. So, <coughs> this table deals with electrolyte composition. And we're going to talk about the composition in the extracellular fluid, which also can include blood plasma and the intracellular fluid. Okay, so the electrolyte composition of these two different fluids. What's the osmolarity of these two fluids? Both are 300 milliosmoles per liter. But when we get down, and that's collectively all of the electrolytes that we find. But when we get down to individual ions, sodium, out in the extracellular fluid is going to be 145, and by the way, we're using milli equivalents. Milli equivalents per liter. That's supposed to be a Q. Sort of. Milli equivalents per liter for these measurements. 
you can just think about this as being 145 units or 145 you're going to see is really, really high. Because out in the intracellular fluid, it's only going to be 12 milli equivalents for sodium. So still 300 milliosmoles per liter, but compositionally, extracellular fluid has a much higher level of sodium, much lower level of sodium in the intracellular fluid. And why is that important? We create concentration gradients, and by creating these concentration gradients, we can develop cur current and do useful work for the cell. So I'll just run through the rest of these. Potassium, really low in the extracellular fluid, really high up here in the intercellular fluid. Then we have negatively charged chloride, which is pretty high out in the cell and pretty low inside of the cell. Calcium carrying its two positive charges. Is going to be a really low concentration in both places, but still a concentration gradient favoring the movement of calcium into the cell. And then the last major uh, ion or electrolyte I want you to be familiar with is this PI, which is inorganic phosphate. Inorganic phosphate normally is very low in the extracellular fluid and much higher as composition uh, as an ingredient for many of the phosphated proteins and molecules that we're going to find inside of the cell. So there's your table of electrolytes. Again, both fluids have the exact same osmolarity, but the composition is different, and that favors the production and the development of uh, concentration gradients to facilitate useful work. Yes? Are you like, using ECF and blood plasma interchangeably? Um, not interchangeably, but the extracellular fluid includes blood plasma. It also includes the interstitial fluid, the tissue fluid. <coughs> All right, so what happens if we have deviations in these different electrolytes? Well, to start out with, when electrolyte composition is at a normal level, that's just simply going to be referred to with the prefix normo. And so having 145 milliequivalents in the extracellular fluid or the blood plasma and 12 uh, milliequivalents per liter in the intracellular fluid for sodium, we would say that that is normonatremia. Natremia being the reason that sodium is Na and not SO or something along those lines because in Latin it was natremi or uh, netron. So natremia, normal natremia, is normal levels of sodium. If uh, electrolyte levels are above normal, anyone happen to know what we would use here? Hyper. So we might have hypercalcemia or hypernatremia. And then how about if we go below normal, normal, hypo, hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia. Now of all of the different electrolytes, the one that is probably the most, <laughs> the one that's probably most important to evaluate or to consider is going to be sodium. Sodium is going to have a very important function as we've already detailed in many of our many of our physiological systems. It's going to have function all over physiology. So function all over physiology. And sodium is going to primarily be balanced by a hormone called aldosterone. So primarily balanced by the hormone aldosterone. So how do we actually balance out sodium? And how do we keep it at normal levels and not too high and not too low? 
So aldosterone has a receptor. It's called the aldosterone receptor. Now let's see uh, if you can think back towards endocrinology. <coughs> what type of molecule aldosterone would be, and give a hint what type of receptor you might actually be binding when we bind the aldosterone receptor. Everybody's looking at me like, what the heck are you talking about? Mm -hmm. It's a steroid. And how do you know? Steroid. And so where is it derived from? <laughs> what lipid in particular? What was the lipid that we used to derive testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen? <laughs> Most of you considered, what, what's, what would you say? You were right, I think. Cholesterol. Okay, so cholesterol, it's a lipid, and we use that to derive aldosterone. Cholesterol can easily cross the membrane because it's a lipid. So most likely the aldosterone receptor is going to be what kind of receptor? Is it going to be bound up in the membrane, or is it going to be free-floating someplace within the cell? Free-floating in the cell. One of the places it could be would be the cytosol, the other place would be the nucleus. It's actually going to be a nuclear receptor. We just broke that down from the fact that it's sterone, so it's a steroid, so it's derived from cholesterol, so that it probably binds, <laughs> crosses directly through the membrane, binds to a soluble protein. The aldosterone receptor is going to be a soluble protein, and in fact, it's a nuclear receptor. Now, whenever you bind a nuclear receptor, what's going to be the end result? Are we going to initiate a second messenger system, or PIP2, or phosphorylation cascade, or maybe is this a nuclear reception event where we increase transcription or decrease transcription of a particular gene? Okay, so we're going to increase transcription because that's most frequently what nuclear factors do, like the aldosterone receptor. In particular, we're actually going to increase the regulation, the transcriptional regulation of the sodium potassium pump. So aldosterone causes an increase in the number of sodium potassium pumps. And those sodium potassium pumps are going to be, in particular, found to form in response to aldosterone in the nephron loop, the distal convoluted tubule, and our collecting duct, or ducts. So, aldosterone increases the sodium potassium pump and this results in movement of sodium from the urine so taken out of the forming urine and puts it back into the bloodstream. Now, here's one thing that we need to know as we balance this electrolyte. What should happen to the blood osmolarity as we move <coughs> sodium from the urine back into the bloodstream? Okay, so what would happen to blood osmolarity if I'm moving sodium from the urine back into the blood? You should expect it to increase because we should be, uh, sodium is matter, it has mass, it takes up space, and so it should be reducing the water. But here's the thing, is it actually does not change the blood osmolarity. 
So we start pumping out the sodium, and we should be increasing osmolarity, but we don't. Does anyone have any theory on why that might be? Sodium and water always go together. So even though we're moving sodium out, we're actually, in effect, also moving water. And so we have a balance of water and sodium entering in, and this reduces the changing of the osmolarity of the blood. So what would happen if we removed aldosterone? We're not going to, we're removing the uh, uh, aldosterone, so nothing's leaving. Sodium remains concentrated in the urine, and we dispose of it. Would the blood osmolarity increase if that aldosterone was released? Water always follows sodium, no matter which direction we're going. <coughs> so this is everything that you'll need for the exam that's coming up on Wednesday, April 22nd. Does everybody have this? Okay, let's start a brand new lecture. By my accounting, we have two more two more physiological systems of the 11 to cover. Digestive system, and then we need to still talk, cover the reproductive system. So the digestive system. Uh, to begin the discussion on the digestive system, what you need to understand is that your cells, the cells that you have in your body right now, they live and survive on the food that you consume. Now, the problem is we can't just feed our cells a hamburger. We have to, which I'm now picturing like a cell that looks like Pac-Man and cheese a hamburger. But you have to process that hamburger. And you have to break it down. And eventually you have to break it down so much that the individual macromolecules, the carbohydrates, the proteins, the nucleic acids, and the lipids that are incorporated in that hamburger are in the individual macromolecule form. Individual molecules of glucose, individual molecules of all 20 amino, uh, amino acids, individual uh, uh, molecules of the four nucleic acids and the lipids. Okay? So you have to break all of that food down. So why do we eat what we eat? Why do we eat meat? And why do we eat vegetables? And why are the, why are those nutrients there? Because those organisms that we're consuming are cell-based organisms, and they are surviving and living off of the same macronutrients that we need to survive. And when we consume them, we're stealing those nutrients away from those buggers, and ultimately utilizing what we need. So we eat food for the cells that they contain. So the whole process here, let's say that apple that you eat today for lunch, that apple consists of a variety of different cells. And you, on, its, on its own, it's an organism, right? You have this whole apple that is, is an organism or part of an organism, and it's comprised of a bunch of different tissues, and those tissues are comprised of different cells. And those cells are comprised of different organelle, and those organelles are comprised of different macromolecules. So you go and you bite that apple, and that begins the breakdown process. You take a bite out of it, it's no longer a full-size apple. It's now a piece of tissue. And you begin to grind that up mechanically. And then you're going to add in some chemicals, and you're going to begin to break that up chemically. And eventually, by the time you get down to the small intestine, those cells have been broken apart, and they've been obliterated, and they've released their individual macromolecules, the glucose, and the fructose, and the other sugars, and nucleic acids, and amino acids. And that's what you absorb, and that's what you require. 
So foods that aren't really animals or plants, so to speak. So, I mean, some of you are drinking coffee here today. Um, I don't see any cola or anything like that. But those types of foods or uh, pudding <laughs> or jello, those obviously aren't cellular-based foods. But they were originally from cellular-based foods. The coffee that you're drinking, we've seeped through and pulled off nutrients from the bean. The jello has been processed from hooves. <laughs> and the pudding is, or sugar is, pre-processed, almost in one sense, pre-digested before you begin to consume. <laughs> so we eat food because of the cells and the macromolecules that are contained within those cells. So I'm just going to refer to the food as foodstuffs. So the food that you consume is going to travel through the GI tract, which is going to be the tube of the digestive system. And in the GI tract, that food that has been consumed is going to be processed both mechanically and chemically to break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller components. And then that processed food is going to be absorbed. And those two things, the mechanical and chemical processing or what we would call digestion and absorption are the two main purposes and functions of the digestive system. By the way, GI, just so we're all on the same page, anyone know what that means? Everybody knows what it means. And what does gastrointestinal action mean? Gastro refers to the stomach, intestinal refers to the tube, small intestine and large intestine. Now, technically, the gastrointestinal tract, the GI tract, it begins at the mouth. So gastrointestinal tract begins here in the mouth with the oral cavity. Now, in the oral cavity and in the mouth, one of the prominent features that we have are the teeth. And the teeth are there to chew or more scientifically, to masticate the food. And this is going to just simply be, you take a bite out of that candy bar or a bite out of that hamburger, and you are beginning to mechanically break that food into smaller and smaller components. So masticating food is mechanical digestion or mechanical breakdown. In addition to the teeth, as we're breaking, mechanically breaking down the food, it's also going to be exposed to the tongue, and the tongue provides taste. Um, even though food is an enjoyable situation or it, it provides pleasure for most people, the tongue, <clears throat> yes, good food will help you to consume, but the tongue is also there to taste for any bad food. It protects you from... you you know, eat a rancid piece of fish or something like that. It's going to protect you from swallowing that bad, tainted, bacteria-infested fish down in the deep within the body. You taste it. Oh, and you spit it out. <clears throat> the oral cavity also houses salivary glands. Salivary glands are going to produce saliva. And the salivary gland which you can see anatomical locations here. You can see that they are ducted. They have ducts that lead into the oral cavity. And we have uh, three different types, the parotid duct, the sublinguinal uh, gland, and then the submandibular duct uh, and submandibular gland that um, produce saliva. And saliva is basically a solution of enzymes. So the salivary gland deposits, as you chew, deposits 
enzymes and mixes that in through the mechanical motion of chewing into the food. And those enzymes begin the process of chemical digestion. So we're going to begin both mechanical digestion and breakdown and enzymatic digestion and breakdown in the oral cavity. In particular, one enzyme that's heavily prominent within the uh, salivary uh, solution is a enzyme called salivary amylase. We know that it's an enzyme because it's ASE. Does anyone happen to know what material this enzyme acts upon? It acts on amylose. Amylose is what? It's a sugar because it's OSE. Anyone know the other name for amylose? I'll give you a hint. Potatoes. Starch. Okay. So when you consume, especially plants, you're going to consume starch, which is a storage molecule for glucose. <laughs> Well, what do we want to do? We eventually want to get down to individual glucose molecules because that's what's going to absorb across the digestive system. And so we're going to begin to cut that amylose up, that starch up, into smaller and smaller pieces of glucose. And since it's happening chemically or enzymatically, this is chemical breakdown. Now, some people claim that there are nutrients that are absorbed through um, the oral cavity. Some people claim that sugar is actually absorbed through the oral cavity. There's very little evidence of that, though. Um, most likely, there's uh, no absorption until really we get into the small intestine. So from the oral cavity, we lead into a tube that goes to the stomach. And that tube is going to be regulated by the pharynx. And we've already talked a little bit about the pharynx when we were talking about respiration. It's the gatekeeper. And the pharynx has an opening called the glottis. And then over the glottis is that cartilaginous flap called the epiglottis. And it's going to be that glottis that is closed by the epiglottis that is going to allow air to be moved into the trachea and food moved into the esophagus. So every time you swallow, the epiglottis closes over or should close over the trachea and keep the food into the esophagus. Okay, so that tube to the stomach starts at the pharynx and with our swallowing action, cover the glottis and allow food to travel into the esophagus. And the esophagus really is going to be the tube that leads into the stomach. Mike, when you go down the wrong way, where did it go? When it goes in the wrong way, it's actually going into the trachea. And then you start to cough, which is the reflex to move it back out in the other direction. Say, I mean, say that again? I'm confused. Does this happen like, is it your body automatically just start digesting stuff as soon as you put it in? And how long does that take? Like, We're going to go through all of that. You're going to see that digestion happens in a variety of locations along the way. Uh, and different aspects of digestion are occurring. Mechanically, we're chewing stuff up in the mouth, and we're beginning that process or that starch breakdown. You're going to see we're going to move into the stomach. The stomach is a storage depot, but it also continues some of the mechanical breakdown, and is a big site for protein breakdown. So, tube to the stomach, pharynx. Uh, the pharynx moves food by swallowing action into the tube, which is the esophagus. So this, you can see, is a, a more full picture of the esophagus. Here's our pharynx, and then uh, leading to the glottis and the epiglottis. Food goes back through the esophagus behind the trachea. So you can feel your trachea 
palpate it through through the skin of your neck, and then the esophagus is going to be deep to the trachea. And it leads all the way down into the stomach. Now, what you're going to see is that as we travel down the esophagus, we're eventually going to get to that point where the esophagus leads into the stomach, and there is going to be a esophageal, lower esophageal sphincter located at the opening of the stomach. And this is actually going to be to keep food in the stomach and so the solutions in the stomach and let prevent them from backing out through um, that uh, opening into the esophagus. You've all heard of acid reflux disease or GERD, and those conditions are uh, caused because you have spillage of the acidic stomach solution back into the esophagus, and it causes that burning sensation that feels like it's near your heart because the esophagus is passing pretty close to the heart. Um, there's also a, another uh, sphincter at the upper portion of the uh, esophagus, uh, esophagus, and every time it's just simply the upper esophageal sphincter, and every time you swallow, this opens up and allows the food to move in. Now, swallowing action gets food into the esophagus, but once you swallow and the food leaves, the, so we take a bite, and we're going to call that bite a bolus, you consume a bolus of a hamburger, and you swallow that down, the action of swallowing moves it into the esophagus. Once it gets into the esophagus, the swallowing action does not continue. The swallowing action is specific to the pharynx. Once in the esophagus, we're going to find out we have a form of gut motility called peristalsis that is going to sort of squeeze the esophagus along. So as we go through the upper esophageal sphincter, it gets pushed open by that bolus of food. We have this nervous system response that occurs where in front of the bolus, you have relaxation in the esophagus, and behind the bolus, it contracts. And the esophageal sphincter is going to contract to squeeze that bolus of food into the esophagus and move it along. Okay, so now we get to the stomach. We allow the food to pass into the stomach through the lower esophageal Sphincter. The stomach is going to be a storage site. So, when's the last time you consumed a meal? Probably about 7, 7.30 this morning. And so you've been sitting here now for a couple of hours. No, oh, you've eaten more recently than that. You didn't eat this morning before class. Aha. So if you were a normal, respectable adult, you would have gotten up at like 5.30 this morning, take a shower, consume the meal. And the point is that you go many hours between meals. You're not constantly eating all day long. I mean, some people do. But most of us, we're not eating a big sausage while we're taking notes in anatomy and physiology class. You had that breakfast sausage earlier this morning. So the food's got to be stored and it's got to be broken down, and we have to slowly deliver it through time to get us from when we consume our meal to when we're going to consume our next meal. Because we don't want to just have like an inundation of nutrients at mealtime and have this big transient spike, and then it goes down in like four and a half hours, you have no nutrient supply. The stomach is going to facilitate that entire process. It's going to be a storage <laughs> site, and it will provide timed delivery of food into the small intestine. So times the deposit of food into the small intestine or into the SI. And so now, rather than getting this transient spike of nutrient intake right with the meal, you have a prolonged intake of nutrients between meals. The stomach also is going to be, that's supposed to be a three. The stomach is also going to be a very important chemical digestion cell. So a very important chemical digestion <coughs> site. Within the stomach, we mix in 
a solution. It's called gastric juice or gastric acid. And it contains enzymes and acid. Enzymes to facilitate chemical digestion, acids to help out with the process. You all know that proteins have a native conformation, and if they get put into a lower pH environment, a more acidic environment, that causes the proteins to denature. So the proteins that you've consumed with your meal are going to end up in the stomach, and in the presence of that acid, they unfold. And that allows enzymes that are specific to breaking apart proteins to be able to get in there and cut up <coughs> the linear strand rather than that globular protein. Small intestine. Chemical digestion site. Enzymes and acids are going to be present. Okay, so that time delivery <coughs> into the small intestine. is going to occur, oh well, here's the stomach, sorry, I should have brought this picture up already. And we're gonna, we'll come back and we'll talk about all the different layers of, of the tissue going on here. Uh, but stomach can, can expand, in fact, it can span up, expand up to about three meters, consume about three meters of food. Which when you think about it, that's a two liter, that's a lot. Two liter Coke and another like one liter of Coke, put that all in your stomach. That's Thanksgiving meal right there. I mean, you're not going to feel very good, but... <laughs> no, before it ruptures, it's going to emanate. You're going to puke all of you. You're gonna, you are going to barf, lose your lunch, pay to, pray to the porcelain god, vomit, emanate. <laughs> we're going to talk about yeah, we're going to talk about that, but um, and we're going to talk why we don't get ulcers all of the time. Because if you think about it, you ever eaten tripe? No. <laughs> tripe is cow stuff. Yes, I have been. Tripe. Tripe. I've. Never been brave enough to try tripe or chitlin. Chitlin is intestine. Do you guys ever watch Bizarre Foods America? Have you ever seen the episode where he's eating, he's eating uh, chitlin, and he goes, "Oh wow, it has a really nice poop flavor," but like in a good way. All right, we're deviating, we're deviating. So, how come we don't consume our stomach? We're going to address that question. Obviously, we can eat tripe, which is cow stomach, and we can digest it. So how come we don't digest our own stomachs? And we're, we're going to get there, just kind of a little bit of foreshadowing. So, Lindsay, we're going to get to your question in a little while. Okay, so food stored, it's mechanically churned up and broken down. Uh, by the time food is ready to be delivered into the small intestine, I and mean, you've seen a version of this before, uh, the solution that gets produced is called chyme. Chyme would be what you usually throw up. That's what chyme is going to look like. It's sort of a brownish, greenish kind of li liquid, not nice solid hamburger or piece of pizza. So that's what's delivered into the small intestine. And once we deliver that into the small intestine, which you can see here, the whole system kind of in reference now, um, we're going to begin the process of absorption. We're also going to continue the process of digestion. So we're going to continue to digest. So there's some additional digestion. <coughs> But this will be one of our first points of absorption. And one of the first nutrients that's going to be absorbed is just simply going to be water. So we begin water absorption. But we're also going to undergo nutrient absorption. So in order to absorb our nutrients, 
they all have to be as small as physically possible. So that means we're not absorbing proteins, we're absorbing individual amino acids. We're not absorbing uh, starch and complex carbohydrates, we're absorbing individual molecules of glucose. We're not absorbing DNA and RNA, we're absorbing the little nucleic acids, the individual nucleic acids. Lipids are going to be a little bit different because we don't, you'll remember there's not really a mono and a poly form of a lipid. Lipids are usually really big. And we actually absorb lipids not into the bloodstream initially, but into the looser lymphatic capillaries. And you'll remember that we had lacteal, which was the heavy white milky substance that, um, because of the presence of those lipids. So we're going to begin that process of absorbing water, absorbing other nutrients. We have some of the additional digestion, but the small intestine is also going to act as an endocrine tissue. Now, it's going to be considered a secondary endocrine tissue because the secondary function is endocrine. The primary function is digestive. Most of the hormones that are being generated, in fact, all the hormones that are being generated by the small intestine are going to be digestive regulators. So the endocrine is even digestive in nature in the fact that it's regulating nutrient absorption and also helping to function as a indicator that maybe you're um, full and you've consumed enough food, which would be, which would be what we call satiety. So you're satiated. So we move now from <clears throat> the small intestine. The small intestine is about 10 or 11 feet in length. And the small intestine dumps the processed nutrient absorbed food into the cecum, which is the initial part of the large intestine or the colon. So the large intestine, here you can see there's the appendix, this is going to be our cecum, and then we have ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, because it's sort of S-shaped, rectum, and the anus. In the large intestine, we have additional water being absorbed. There is going to be some small, small amount of nutrient absorption. I'm going to just simply refer that to as final nutrient absorption. That final nutrient absorption is going to be um, very small in proportion to what's being absorbed through the small intestine, but some of it's actually going to occur. Primarily what's going to be happening here is these final two things of water absorption and final nutrient absorption. The large intestine is just basically taking the final nutrients and water out of the chyme to begin to form fecal material or feces. At the far end of the large intestine, we have this kind of S-shaped or sigmoid-shaped colon. The sigmoid colon is going to be a storage site for the formed fecal material, the formed feces. The last two portions of the small intestine, I'm sorry, of the large intestine rather, are going to be the rectum and the anus. It is the responsibility of these two features to take the stored fecal material from the sigmoid colon and move that fecal material out of the body. And the feces that are formed, the composition of the feces is going to be undigested nutrients. both living and non-living or dead bacteria. And then occasionally we're going to have some other microorganisms. 
such as during some sort of infection. If you have a contestant one, you know, that one. Yeah, we have that protective lining um, that goes into every part of uh, um, every opening. But in addition to that, you have what are called good bacteria. And the more good bacteria that you have, the less room you have for bad bacteria. And so things like uh, vir virulent strains of E. coli can be held down because you have L. acidophilus and all of those other good, so to speak, bacteria. But that being said, sometimes bacteria do actually enter into the bloodstream and they can form sepsis. But for the most part, the bacteria are going to remain in the gut because they're stealing nutrients. And it's a symbiotic relationship, right? Because you consume the food, they steal the nutrients from you, but then as a byproduct of your metabolism, they're giving you things like selenium and other vitamins and minerals you can't really produce on your own and really don't consume from your diet. Um, so they want to live where there's going to be nutrients. They don't want to make their way into other parts of the body where they're not going to be as nutrient uh, available, not as many nutrients as uh, available. So that was the gastrointestinal tract, just basic anatomy. We're going to come back and talk a little bit more about the physiology. But before we do that, I want to do two more things here. I want to talk about digestive organs that are used to support the digestive process. So digestive organs support digestion. Uh, and then I also want to come back and talk more about the histology of the tract. We've talked about basic gross anatomy, but I want to talk about histology as well. So these digestive organs that support the digestive system or the digestive process, you've probably already begun to think about a couple of these. One of them is going to be the liver. Now, the liver, it has a variety of different functions. Several of them are digestive. There's some endocrine function, and then there's also some... Uh, actually immune function as well. Digestive function, one, it's a big storage site for glucose, and it gets put into uh, a form of um, glucose that's called glycogen. It's a big storage molecule that's analogous to starch in plants. Glycogen is the starch of animals. <laughs> the liver also is going to be a producer of bile. So a bile producer stores nutrients and also is going to be involved in processing nutrients. Now the bile that's produced by the liver is eventually sent to a second digestive support organ called the gallbladder. By the way, all one word. So you can see the gallbladder here, and you can see that there's a duct system. I want to kind of pull that out. So this would be liver back here behind the uh, gallbladder, and then there's this duct supply coming out of the liver that has a common origin with the gallbladder. So the bile that's produced by the liver is sent through that duct system and eventually makes its way into the gallbladder. <clears throat> so the gallbladder uh, is going to accept bile from the liver, and that bile from the liver is going to be stored and concentrated. So it's stored and it's put into this more concentrated form, and then it is going to be released from the gallbladder. The concentrated uh, bile comes down through uh, the common bile duct and enters into the upper portion of the small intestine called the duodenum. That's the name of the upper portion of the uh, small intestine. comes through that opening of the common bile duct and begins to mix into the material that's being released by the stomach. 
into the small intestine. Um, and it's going to be called upon, or bile is, is released in response to very fatty meals because it's involved in fat digestion. So it makes a little bit of sense that if you have a gallbladder patient, that they're not going to be on a high fat diet. If you give them ice cream, they're going to go into a gallbladder attack. They have gallstones or something else like, you know, like a low ability to drain the gallbladder. They're going to have excessive pain because of uh, those issues as fat is calling on the gallbladder for the digestive process. All right, one more. I must be good. Yes. Um, you know, that's a, yes, you can live without a gallbladder just like you can live without one of your legs, but there's still a lot of function there. You lose your, uh, a great deal of your ability for fat digestion. People who don't have gallbladder, they typically have a higher concentration of fat in their stool. Um, so yeah, you can survive and you still actually can function okay, but I, I, don't want, I don't want to lose my gallbladder. I like french fries so much. And usually you have to mod modify your diet to sort of adjust for those, those issues. All right, we're out of time. We'll pick up with the pancreas on Monday. Thank you.